I always like to say to the uh, parishioners at my, uh, at my parish that there are two very important buildings on East Capitol Street. Very, very important buildings. And the second most important and powerful building is the end of East Capitol Street. It's called the United States Capitol. And um, it's a very powerful building. And, uh, a lot of senators and congressmen and women and has uh, a lot of big deliberations. They've got a president of the Senate, all kinds of fun stuff, a speaker of the House. But that's the second most powerful building on East Capitol Street. So uh, the first most powerful is, is my parish. <laughs> because uh, they've got the president of the Senate, but uh, we have the king of the universe in, in the tabernacle. Amen. So, and whatever they are able to do that's of good down there, Today I'm talking on the topic of the miracle of marriage, so uh, let me set the stage for uh, just explaining the title. That's really part one of the talk. What do I mean by the miracle of marriage? Well, I want to say that uh, sometimes when you hear that expression, well, that's a miracle, or you know, something you you're thinking of something that's unusual, outstanding, or um, sometimes you know we might use the expression, it's going to take a miracle. In other words, boy, this is going to take a lot of help. But when I say miracle, I'm really talking about understanding the grace of marriage that's announced by the Lord Jesus himself regarding marriage. And the miracle that the Lord announces is fundamentally these words. They are no longer two. They are one. That's the miracle. I'm quoting from Matthew 19. Now, let's, let me give you some context. The scribes and the Pharisees were seeking to trouble Jesus as he approached Judea. And um, they said, look, uh, we've heard that you have a strict teaching on marriage. Now, I'm paraphrasing them a little. But <clears throat> isn't it so that we can divorce our wives for any reason whatsoever? Moses, you know, permitted this. What do you say? And he said, have you not read? Have you not read that at the beginning the Creator made the male and female? And for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and cling to his wife, and the two of them shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two. They are one. And what God has joined together let no one divide. Now, the fact that two become one is the miracle. So I'm not just saying, marriage is a miracle, as some kind of an explanation, you know, just kind of a, an interesting expression or, or something. I'm speaking to you about a theological reality that we call the sacrament of marriage. Now, all the sacraments have about them a reality. And too often, even very faithful Catholics completely miss this and, in effect, turn sacraments kind of as just rituals that we go through. And sometimes even consider them to be tedious rituals. You know, some people go to mass like, like getting their flu shot. You know, let's hope this thing is as short and painless as possible. And I know you all are above average, but I, so I'm not talking about any of y'all, right? <laughs> but there are just some folks that you know they're tapping on their watch. You know, if the thing goes a little long, and is the preacher still up there? I mean, my goodness, you know. Some people get visibly angry if things go over 45 minutes. You know. It's like getting a flu shot. So the whole beautiful sacrament of the liturgy and, and uh, the, the Holy Eucharist becomes more to them of a tedious ritual. But sacraments are not tedious rituals. They're not even just rituals. They are transformative realities. So that in Holy Mass, ordinary bread and wine become miraculously the body and the blood of Christ. Now, in marriage, therefore, the same thing is true. We don't just go through rituals, because isn't that pretty, and look at her come down the aisle. Isn't it, you know, we, we look at all these things, and we sort of think a lot about the trappings and about the rituals. But, brothers and sisters, in a, in a, in a sacramental marriage, a validly celebrated sacramental marriage, the Lord works a miracle. Two come, one leave. He said, well, it still, it still looks like two. I know, don't trust your eyes. We'll get to that in a minute. But Jesus says, they are no longer two. They are one. And that's the miracle. 
That's the miracle. So the miracle of marriage, when I, when I gave this title, uh, I'm not just talking about, isn't marriage wonderful? I hope you all would agree it is, but I, I'm going to tell you later on in the talk, marriage has its troubles too. This is not just another way of saying marriage is wonderful. It's a way of saying, I mean this quite literally, ma 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 true, valid, sacramental marriage is a miracle. Because two become one by God's grace. And that is the beautiful thing. So what I'm speaking to you then about is the great grace of marriage. And I will say that one of the sadnesses I had about the recent synod that concluded was that it would seem, I haven't read all the full documents, they're not all fully translated, but so little was really said about grace. We are all focused on the troubles and the trials and the sociological and the psychological difficulties, and they're there. But there's also grace. Grace. So, marriage is a miracle. Two become one. Two become one. Now, let me say a little word about uh, sacraments in general, because I think it's important to do a little bit of sacramental theology with you. When it comes to faith in general, and especially when it comes to sacraments, do not trust your eyes. Trust your ears. The Bible says, faith comes by hearing, and hearing from the Word of God. So, faith comes by hearing, not by seeing. We, we're, we're very, <clears throat> we give great emphasis and weight to what our eyes tell us. You know? But, um, our eyes are not actually that reliable. In fact, it's very easy to fool your eyes. Your eyes can be fooled very quickly. That's how magicians make their money. You know that, right? I mean, they like to be called illusionists today, right? Right? But they make their money by tricking your eyes, and it's easy to do. How do they make that coin appear as, as if out of nowhere? They just distracted your eyes for half a second. Kind of brought it up, you know? Easiest thing in the world. Well, not the easiest thing in the world. I can't pull it off. I'm not a good magician. But, but those who are, have a quick hand and are deft at it, they can quickly, easily fool your eyes. Make you almost appear that something appeared out of nowhere. It didn't. They just tricked your eyes. So, your eyes can be fooled and deceived. So you've got to trust your ears when it comes to faith. Faith is about things that are, is the evidence of things that are unseen. See? Some people say seeing is believing. No, it's just seeing. I'm from Missouri, the show me state. So we give great emphasis to our eyes, but in, when it comes to faith, trust your ears, not your eyes. Now, let's take, a, let's take a thought for a minute about the sacrament of the Holy Eucharist. You know, your eyes still see what appears to be bread. If you were to touch, taste or touch and taste like bread. and So uh, our senses <clears throat> are all saying it's still bread or still wine. Amen? But our ears say what? And again, they are. what we hear is from the Word of God. This is my body. This is my blood. So what is to be believed? Your eyes or your ears? Your ears. St. Thomas in the beautiful hymn that we often sing, usually by the title Adorote Devote, uh, Humbly I Adore Thee, has this to say regarding the sacrament of the Holy Eucharist and the need to listen to our ears and Pay no attention to our other senses. He says, Visus gustus tac or tactus in te fariter. Hmm? Sight and taste and touch and this are all deceived. Said, audito tuto creditur. Only the hearing, but only the hearing is safely believed. This is my body. This is my blood. He goes on to say, Credo quid quid dixi dei fivius. I believe whatever the Son of God says, and nothing is more true than the word of truth himself. So, when it comes to the sacrament of Holy Communion, what do you need to do? You need to trust your ears, not your eyes, not your taste, not your touch, not the smell, but only the hearing. It comes from the word of God. This is my body. This is my blood. Well, if that's true with the sacrament of Holy Communion, it's also true with all the sacraments. We don't see a baptism, all we see is water being poured over a baby's head. We could be washing baby's hair, but we hear a word. I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we know by faith that that child is washed clean of original sin, dies to their old self, rises to a new life. They are, they, if you will, die in one instant and rise to new life in another instant. They become a member of the body of Christ. The very heavens are open. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. All this comes by hearing, but not by seeing. But it's all there. 
And therefore, when it comes to marriage, the miracle is accessed by the hearing, not by the seeing. For it still appears to come and to go back out. Right? But if, you're, if we're dealing with the sacramental valid marriage, they are no longer two. I'm just quoting Jesus here. Uh, they are no longer two. They are one. Now, it still looks like two but to us, but it, they are one. But By the way, she's always still better looking. <clears throat> now, um, that's what I mean by the miracle. Now, like all the sacraments, though, the effects of a sacrament, once received, sometimes take a little while for us to begin to experience as a lived reality. For example, when you receive Holy Communion, ideally, if you are receiving it faithfully and fruitfully, you increasingly become more and more the Christ that you receive. You increasingly become like Him. You are what you eat. I know that. <laughs> you are what you eat. And uh, if, if we're receiving Christ regularly, faithfully, fruitfully, and we're combining that with prayer and regular confession, and we're receiving uh, Him, you know, as I say, in a, state of in a state of grace, faithfully and fruitfully, we are increasingly going to become more holy, more like unto Christ, the one whom we receive. As St. Augustine says, Christian, become, become what you are. Christian, become what you are. <laughs> okay? So, um, we, uh, but, but, but become, you know, become what you receive, you see. So we're, we're invited then to see that, yes, we don't instantly become Christ by just the one simple first communion we receive. Now, God could do that, but generally, there's an old saying that grace builds on nature. Hmm? And therefore, uh, we change slowly. You know, I didn't get to be six feet tall uh, with kind of gray in my beard and 30 or 40 pounds overweight. Uh, I didn't come out of the womb like this, and my mother's very glad. <laughs> um, I got this way, little by little. And so it is our nature as human beings to kind of change slowly. And so therefore, the sacraments convey a reality to us that is available to us at once, but which we tend to grow into and come to realize and experience more gradually as the years go by. All right, now, <coughs> marriage. They are no longer two. They are one. At first, when a couple's first married, they, they may feel emotionally very close, very one. Maybe they're still very much in love. And I have to say, though, you know, with all the, with all the promiscuity and stuff that goes on today, you know, the, the early years of a marriage are kind of, eh, go home today. You know, there isn't the same kind of excitement and romantic attention to those years, sadly, among many couples. I'm saying there are some couples that do things right, and they have those years. But at first there may seem to be a kind of an intensity and so on, but then a, kind of a coming in for a landing. And we'll talk about that a little more in a, in a moment of the talk. And then there's a long number of years where there may be some tension, some division, some difficulties and heartaches where they don't always feel like they are no longer two, they are one. But over the years, again, if a couple is faithful, hmm, they pray, getting to confession, receiving the sacrament of communion, praying regularly, and so on. Little by little, much healing begins to take place. And that reality becomes more obvious to them and even to others. I'll give you a couple of kind of funny examples and maybe some, something a little more serious. But the first example would be, I have discovered, when I was a kid, I, I was very observant. And I used to observe that married couples looked a lot alike. So they always look more like brother and sister. And my mother kind of thought, kind of thought that was weird. But I, but, and I lost that as I got to be, but as I got older again, I started to notice it again, that many couples who are married, I see a family resemblance, even though they, they come from different families, over the years. And remember, a resemblance isn't just the physical features, but mannerisms, hmm? the way people talk, certain habitual things, phrases, all of those things begin to kind of, over the years, blend a little bit, and they, they actually start to look and sound a lot alike. Hmm? The other thing I've noticed, um, okay, again, mostly, mostly in a humorous vein, when I go to a restaurant, I love to do a little experiment, look around and find a younger couple, nervously talking, looking around, maybe she'll quickly look in the mirror, 
<laughs> yeah. All right. But a lot of nervous talk. And then I look for an older couple. They're looking at the menu. <laughs> They already know what each other's going to order. <laughs> and then they don't say much. They just kind of sit there, look around. Almost look, they're not bored. They look a little bored sometimes, but they're not really bored. They're just sitting there. What, what's, what's there to say? You've already said it, right? And at a certain point, at a certain point, you don't, you don't need to say a lot of stuff, you know? And so as they're, over the years, they start to look a lot alike and sound a lot alike, and they're, 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 all the chatter and conversation begins to kind of get a little quieter, and there's just a lot of sitting quietly in each other's presence. And I'm not saying there, there's no communication. There's communication going on. Just, you just don't need a lot of words to do it. I've discovered that ideally, and I hope you have in prayer, that if you've been at prayer a while, you become less wordy in your prayer. And you just, I've learned over the years to just kind of sit quietly with God. I don't say a lot when I pray. I just quietly and with the Lord. And uh, words are less necessary. Um, so as relationships deepen, you see, words become less, but the unity becomes deeper and richer than words and mere chatter and talk and, you know, posturing and things that, uh, that tend to go on earlier in a relationship. They look a lot alike in mannerisms. And the old song comes to mind, I've grown accustomed to her face. That old song from, what is it, My Fair Lady? Yeah. yeah. Well, those are one of the ways, just kind of humorous ways that I've noted that over the years as couples really, and again, I'm talking about couples that have been, you know, as faithful as, you know, reasonably faithful, first of all, to each other, but to prayer, to God, to the sacraments. There's a kind of a growth. I don't say it's without sin. I don't say there's no tension, but there's just that kind of easing into a, where the, you start to see a lot more vis visually of the mysterious reality that was announced from the beginning. They are no longer two. They are one, says Jesus. Now there's also, though, I think, um, again, a deeper and richer reality, too, that we'll talk about a little bit more as, as we go, but I, I, I want you to see that, uh, again, the miracle is that God takes two and makes them one. And that mystery unfolds down through the years. And very often there's ups and downs in it, difficulties, and we'll talk again about that more in a moment. All right, but let's be very clear then. I wanted to just be very clear about what, the, what I mean by the title of this talk. And to invite you who are married, or some who might be younger and are thinking about marriage, to consider the mystery and the reality that God has worked in your life. And it's not a, a unity that's just a simply a kind of hallmark card unity, a lot of cheesy stuff and notions. It's a, it's a deep harmony that's sometimes rooted in years of struggle together, Pain and grief, loss, as well as beautiful times, wonderful experiences together, just years of going on vacations and memories, and both good and bad. It's, it's, it's the stuff of, a, of, a, of a, a whole range of experiences that makes a couple experience that oneness that God announced from the beginning in their valid sacramental marriage. Okay. Now, with that in mind, I'd like to review a little bit with you about God's plan for marriage and show you how I think we've gotten into a little bit of trouble today and then kind of return though to the basic theme uh, of this oneness, this miracle of marriage and maybe just finish with a story, okay? So with all that in mind, let's take a, let me remind you of God's plan for marriage, which is obviously in, not well understood by many, many, many people today, including those who sit in our pews but certainly in our culture. Now, God's plan for marriage, I've just stated quickly, and then I'll just kind of review the text with you. One man for one woman till death do them part, bearing fruit in the, in the beautiful love, uh, bearing fruit in the, in, in, in the love of their children, okay? One man for one woman till death do them part, bearing fruit in their children, okay? Now, all of those have a biblical basis, what I just said to you. So, let's begin, but I'm just going to, from memory, speak to you about Genesis chapter 2, where most all of this text that I'm about to quote to you comes from. But uh, God uh, had created all things, and it formed Adam, but not yet Eve. And uh, he uh, then said, it is not good for the man to be alone. Now, pay attention. 
That's not just a nice little slogan. Ponder that. It is not good for the man to be alone. So what does this mean? It's not good. And by the way, I checked it out in both the Hebrew and the Greek, and you know what it says? It's not good. <laughs> but note this, and of course, by extension, it's not good that the woman be alone. It is not good that the man should be alone. Now, what about, though, someone such as... So in other words, we're all summoned to some sort of spousal relationship. We are summoned to a relationship with another who will complete us in a complementary way. Now, you say, but Father, you're not uh, married. And I say, I'm not married in the conventional sense, but I am not a single man. I am not a bachelor. Don't call me that. I do have a spouse. I do have a bride. Mother Church. <laughs> She's a beautiful bride. Very demanding. <laughs> Long honeydew list. <laughs> And the other problem is she's always right. <laughs> but I am in a spousal relationship. Likewise, a religious sister is in a spousal relationship with the Lord Jesus. They wear wedding rings for a reason. See? They are a spouse to Christ. So we don't conceive of these vocational choices that aren't conventional marriage as non-spousal. All right? We are to be, those of us live celibately, still to be in a spousal relationship because it is not good for the man, the woman, to be alone. Okay? Now, there's a great debate in the church today. Is there a vocation to the single life? And boy, do I get in trouble when I say this. The answer is no. Not, not to the single life as such. Now, there are some who, for various reasons, do not attain to marriage or priesthood of the religious life. But on account of their single status, may have a, vac a vocational capacity toward the church or, by the, or to the community because they are, you know, not in a marriage and raising children of their own. So that would be the vocation, not to be single per se, because again, it is not good for us to be alone. We are to be in a spousal relationship with a man or a woman, if you're depending on who you are, and then, if you're not married in the conventional sense, with the church in some way. All right? Okay. Now, with all that in mind, we're back to the Genesis text. It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make, I the Lord, will make a suitable partner for Adam. Suitable partner. Pay attention. I will make a suitable partner. And what does he make? He did not make Steve. I don't mean to be flippant, but we just need to bring it home. He made Eve. The suitable partner for Adam is a woman. Okay. Now, not only did he not make Steve, but he made Eve, but also he made one woman. He did not make Eve and Ellen and Jane and Sue and Mary and Beth and Betty Sue. One man needs a suitable partner, and that is one woman. Okay? Now, these are very important teachings because they are being set aside today, and they are being uh, disputed. There is, there are, I don't need to tell you about this whole huge problem of so-called same-sex uh, you know, relationships. They like to call them gay marriages. There's no such thing. We might call them same-sex relationships, but they are not spousal, they are not marriages, they are not what God intends. It is not The suitable partner for a man is not another man. The suitable partner for a woman is not another woman. It is not according to either natural law or to the law of God that this is what we would call a suitable partner. We cannot go with that. We cannot agree with that. That is an error of our modern time. Now, the next error that's coming next, and is, don't kid yourself, this is already in the court system. And in places like Denver and Utah, already polygamists are in the court system saying, look, you know, you're, you're, you're letting the guys get married to the guys. You're letting the girls... You know, look, why not three to get married? Why not four or five to get married? Why not a whole harem to get married? And really, legally, at this point, I, I'm not a little lawyer, but... I can't imagine legally what, how, how, how they're going to avoid winning. But as a church, and as a people of God, and those who are also uh, uh, beloved of natural law, we have to insist that polygamy is absolutely not a good idea, and it is not to be uh, embraced. And you say, but Father, but Father, there are, there's polygamy in the Bible, and there is. 
many of the patriarchs had many wives. You know, David had eight wives. Uh, Solomon had a thousand. Um, you know, Gideon had a good number of wives. You know, uh, Jacob had several wives, and so on. I could go down the list. Now, the Bible teaches in one of two ways, sometimes by direct precept. But sometimes the Bible just says, here's what happened. And you connect the dots. Now, by the way, if you read my blog, if you don't, there's just something in your flyer there that'll tell you how to get there. But you can just type in the word polygamy in the search bar. I've written articles on this already, okay? I think the, the title of the article is, Don't Do Polygamy! <laughs> Bad idea. Let me explain basically as quickly as I can. Polygamy in the Bible is not, God does not ride down on a lightning bolt and say, how dare you have more than one wife? He tolerates it, but lets them learn this is not the way. So, we see that every time there's more than one wife, there's trouble. I've set you up a little, because it's not really the women who cause the trouble. It's the sons of the different mothers who cause the trouble. And it is almost always a bloodbath. Let me give you some quick examples. The story you're probably most familiar with is the story of Joseph in the Bible, right? The Old Testament Joseph. And you remember that he was the son of Rachel, and she was Jacob's favorite wife. And uh, he, she had been barren for many years, but suddenly she had a Joseph. And oh, how he doted on Joseph. He loved Joseph, and Joseph was just his favorite son. Now, the other brothers are starting to feel threatened. What about, because what's, what's in the mix? You know, patrimony. In other words, uh, uh, land, uh, becoming the heir, ha having the uh, authority, taking up the, uh, taking up the household, uh, land, property, money, all that stuff's in the mix here, see? So they decide, let's just kill him. But they figured they could make a little money, so they ended up selling him to slavery. Now, I'm just going to end the story there. You know there's a long saga to the story, but at the end of the day, you already see that polygamy is not the wives, it's the sons of the different mothers and the rivalries between them and debates over who gets daddy's money and who gets the inheritances and how much and how much land and who got, who, you know, ugly stuff. Now, that's not the ugliest of all. It gets a lot uglier. I could, I mean, uh, Gideon, I don't know how many wives I forget he had, but he had 70 sons. And one day, Zerubbabel, Gideon dies, and Zerubbabel says, look, hey guys, let's, let's go mourn our father. He invites them all to a party and slits their, every one of their throats, and he becomes king. 69 of his brothers died that day at the party, the repast, you might call it. Bloodbath, polygamy, power, inheritance, kingship. Go with me to... David's household. David had eight wives. Now, um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have time to develop all the story with you, but one of his sons, Amnon, raped his half-sister, Tamar, who, uh, whose full brother was Absalom. And Absalom went to David and said, Do you see what your son has done to my sister? And David said, Now, no, son, you shouldn't have done that. Now, come on, don't ever do that again. And Absalom was furious. He raped my sister, your daughter, and his half-sister. And all you say is, Absalom was so angry he went into rebellion. And he called up a war against his father. And thousands died in the war. And all kinds of intrigue came from that. Now, by the way, just notice the problem of a blended family, right? Because I'm going to just tell you that Young men don't have the same reserve towards stepsisters that they do toward their own natural blood sister. And sometimes they take sexual advantage in a way they wouldn't with their own natural sister. So that led to problems, and then David's favoritism of certain sons over others because he favored different wives and all of that kind of stuff, and the sons hate each other, and the anger and the wrath, and now his whole household is at war. Absalom, his own son, and finally, sadly, Absalom dies in the war, and David says, it's all my fault. You're darn right. You're darn right it's your fault. See? Now, it, it doesn't stop there. Because one of his other wives, Bathsheba, began to, you know, manipulate. And Jehoiakim was supposed to be the um, successor, but uh, she maneuvers to get Solomon appointed successor king. And once again, that's all about polygamy, and he ends up, Solomon ends up plotting the death of his half-brother. 
he has to go because I'm going to be the king. And so there's all kinds of intrigue, palace intrigue, and it's all about polygamy. It's about different wives and sons of different mothers and who's going to inherit, who's going to keep, who's going to reign, who's going to be the king. Now Solomon, wow, talk about like father like son on steroids. He ended up having a thousand wives. And so decadent and rebellious did the whole kingdom become over all this palace intrigue with a thousand wives that the entire northern kingdom separated from the southern kingdom after Solomon died. And eventually there was war between, the, they were in a state of war between the north and the south. And eventually the whole northern kingdom was swept away by the Assyrians and the south didn't lift a finger to help. Polygamy. I'm not saying it's the only factor, but it's a huge factor. Don't do polygamy. It brings pain, it brings grief, rivalries, factions, dissensions, and outright murder and even war. That's the biblical message about polygamy. So the Bible tells stories in two ways. Sometimes by precept, and sometimes just by teaching us stories. So God had a plan, one man for one woman till death do, do them part. Well, there were two ways that the ancient, in the long reign of sin in the Old Testament, that they departed. One was divorce, and the other was polygamy. And both of these were departures from God's plan, and they always led to trouble. Okay, now, let's continue. Let's get back to the Genesis account, because I, I'm trying to show you that God has a plan for marriage, and we are systematically dismantling it in our culture, in our times. So we see that, again... It's not good for the man to be alone. I will make a suitable partner. He made one woman, Eve. And then God says in that text, This is why a man shall leave his father and mother and cling to his wife, and the two of them shall become one flesh. Now, cling is a strong word. Cling is a very strong word. It means stick like glue. It means, honey, if you ever leave me, I'm going with you. Okay. Okay. Just make it plain, right? <laughs> Cling means a man really works just to keep unity with his wife, and likewise a wife with her husband. The devil's going to try to divide. That means they've got to be on their job and really work for unity. And therefore, a man should cling, stick like glue. Honey, if you ever leave me, I'm going with you. It was a very, it's a strong word. Okay, now, again, divorce sets that aside. But God's plan, one man for one woman till death do them part. And then he says to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. So the main work of a marriage is to have children. Now, yes, they give support and they love each other. That's all nice, but it's all basically geared because the fact that marriage's main work is to have children shows you why it has that structure that God gave it. Because, first of all, you've got to have to have a child. You have to have a man, a man and a woman. Okay, and all these crazy in vitro things and all that aside, I'm not going to get into bioethics today. But the bottom line is you've got to have a man and a woman to have a child. Secondly, they should be in a stable, lasting union because that is what is best for children. Children need a stable environment where their father and mother have committed to each other and will work out whatever differences they have and, and work to stay together and they will in every way um, work very hard at preserving a unified uh, you know, marriage and family and household so that those children can depend on them and have a strong, stable, sturdy foundation to grow up in, right? And <clears throat> another aspect of this is that it just makes psychological sense, everything I just said to you, that that's best for children. But beyond that, there's also the beauty of, there's two geniuses about being human. There's the masculine genius and the feminine genius, right? And every child needs and deserves to be, have the masculine genius presented to them and the feminine genius. I learned things from my father that I could not have learned from my mother, and from my mother things that I could not have learned from my father. And this completes who I am. All right? Possessed of an understanding and a knowledge. I'm male, but I have, like any male, feminine qualities, just as women have masculine qualities. They learn these things. This is all part of who we are. And we must be, if you will, given, it just makes good psychological, sociological sense that children are best raised with the witness of a father and a mother in a very stable, lasting union, stable home with a masculine genius and a feminine genius presented to them consistently. Okay? 
All that just is common sense, you see. Sadly, it isn't very common anymore. In fact, by policy now, the government is insisting, we in the, in, down in D.C., we had to get out of a, the adoption business. The Catholic Charities had to step out of it because they were basically decertified. De Why? Because we, would, we refused to hold equal same-sex same couples to heterosexual couples or single mother or single father to heterosexual couple, married couple. Now, we said we wouldn't do that because the best home for a child that we should look for, especially for newborn infants, is to find a married father and mother. That's best for them. Well, it's not so you're violating people's rights. What about the children? What about what's best for them? It's all about adults today and their rights and their feelings. And we sing songs like, what about the children? And we don't mean it. We don't mean it for a minute. Not culturally, not collectively anyway, you know? We don't mean it. I don't mean everybody here, but I'm saying in the, in the wide culture, we don't mean that for a minute. It's all about adults and their liberties and their preferences and their freedoms and their feelings and children are the ones who suffer, see? And so we were decertified. We can no longer do adoptions now down in D.C. And I think Maryland may have been, may, may have already happened here too, I don't know. Bottom line is um, we refuse because it just makes sense that the best environment should be sought for a child. To intentionally deprive a child of the best environment, of something less than a married father and a mother, to intentionally subject them to that is an injustice. A lot of people talk about social justice. Well, that's socially unjust right there, you see. And yet, we inflict this on children daily. Okay? Now, sometimes there will be a situation where there's a married couple and someone dies or there's a tragic thing, but even then, you know, that's a, an anomaly. We try to find people to help fill that gap, you see. But to intentionally put a child in a single parent setting or two men or two Water. women, that is an injustice Water. to them, okay? Now, for all the reasons stated, Okay, here's where we are today then, right? God has a plan for marriage, and we have systematically dismantled every bit of it. Now, there's a history to this. It didn't just happen in the last 10 years. In fact, I would argue, if you were to go back with me, that we've really been redefining marriage now in different ways, going back 50 to 60 years, all right? It started with uh, contraception, right? The, the whole notion of contraception is there is no necessary relationship between sex and procreation. And that this, inf this, this, of course, led to a great debasement in the understanding of sexuality. When it's no longer connected to having children, people become frivolous in their thinking about it. It's all about pleasure and what I want and, you know, all these things and let's just turn off the fertility part of it and we can just have a lot of fun. And people become flippant about something that is a very delicate deep part of the human personality, they get lost, they get confused, and deeply hurt. There's a lot of very hurt souls. If any of you ever heard of her, Dr. Jennifer Rohrbach Morse has the, uh, uh, the Ruth Institute, and it is for victims of the sexual revolution. And she points out, and she's right, we're all, somehow we're all victims, and a lot of us are also perpetrators. Sometimes both, you know, you see the idea? The sexual revolution has tremendous numbers of victims. Okay, starting with the children who are aborted, but there's all the way down to people who have desperately hurt feelings and have felt used and abused, treated like trash, you see, because we're frivolous about sex. Now, that infected notion of sex then was also brought into marriage. So now the thinking became quickly, there is no necessary connection between getting married and having children. In fact, contraception was originally proposed as something for married couples, because if a couple wants to have kids, that's great. That's a, that's a wonderful way of accessorizing your marriage. But if they don't want to have it, that's fine too. I'm sorry, it isn't fine. God said that a marriage, marriage exists for the procreation and the rearing of children. See? Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it is his instruction to the married, to the married couple. Now, um, so we set that aside. That was all the way back in the late 50s and into the 60s with the pill and all that stuff. And a lot of people just ran along, this is great, this is great. It wasn't great, okay, it wasn't. We, had, we separated what God has joined. It's never a good thing to separate what God has joined. It's like nuclear fission. 
big explosive things. When you split what God is meant to be together, and you split it, explosive power goes out. The sexual revolution has incredible damage to our culture, and likewise to our families, and likewise this misunderstanding of marriage now uh, as a nice to have a kid or two, but um, you know, you don't have to. And that's a redefinition of marriage. That's a redefinition. Don't you doubt it. Because God said, be fruitful and multiply. Now, secondly, the second redefinition came in 1969 with the first no-fault divorce laws, right? Whereas the culture, we started saying divorce should be easy. Now, before 1969, some of you are older than I are. You remember these things better than I do. But divorce was kind of rare. Uh, and when it happened, people were really shocked. I remember in 1965 or 6, maybe, I was just a little kid, but I heard my parents whispering. And you know when, when parents whisper, the kid's ears go, <laughs> What are you whispering? And finally they fessed up and they said, Well, the white family down the street is getting divorced. And I'm like, we never heard of this word. And what's that? Well, then they were whispering, even though we were in our own house. You know, they were whispering because it was so shocking. Well, it means that they're not going to stay married and they're going to go live in different places. And you're like, Really? Now, that wasn't that long ago. I'm not that old of a guy. I'm old. I used to be young, tan, and trim, and now I'm old, white, and fat, but I'm not that old yet. <laughs> it, divorce was pretty rare. It was hard to get a divorce before 1969. It took years sometimes, you know, legal wrangling and all that. Something it was so hard to get a divorce that people would actually go to Mexico to get them, you know? Now, in 1969, Ronald Reagan, governor of California, signed the first no-fault divorce law. You could, get, you could turn in your paperwork and be out of a marriage in a month. And every state quickly followed suit. And divorces just skyrocketed. Now, I don't, I don't know where the Catholic Church was at that time, to be honest with you. I was pretty young. I don't remember. Did we protest? I think we were too busy turning altars around and tuning up guitars. You remember what was going on there? Right? I think 1969, where were we, right? We were pretty inwardly focused. Uh, but anyway, all that to say, I, I don't know if there were a lot of bishops that protested this or not. I don't know where we were at the time, frankly. I see no evidence. But again, all of this stuff was just taken up by most Catholics. Yeah, this is great, you know, come on. I mean, people have a right to be happy, don't they? And if they're not in a happy marriage, shouldn't they be able to get out? Doesn't God want me to be happy? And that's the thinking. And that's a redefinition of marriage, because no longer should a man cling to his wife. If things go bad, well, just dump her or... You know, just come to an amicable separation, or, you know, just, you know, just, what's this, who, why should you cling to something? Why work it out if, if you're not happy, see? And so that was the thinking, right? And uh, so that's, of course, that's where all that narcissistic culture and all the kind of stuff we have today, you know, all began. You know, it's all about God wants me to be happy. Well, you know what? God might actually have something a little bigger in mind than just you. What do you think? Hmm? But most people don't get much further than that kind of thinking. Maybe, maybe God has in mind that your children would suffer. Or maybe God has in mind that the culture would suffer. And that wider, in other words, if, if one couple and two, two and three and then dozens and thousands of couples start getting divorced, maybe the culture would suffer and maybe children would suffer and maybe whole, uh, the entire civilization would be threatened. Maybe God has something bigger in mind than just your personal happiness. What do you think? But you see, narcissism says, no, it's all about me. Uh, hard truth of life number two and three. You, and number three is, you're not that important. Oops, did I say that? You're not that important. Now, that doesn't mean that you're not in God's way or God doesn't care about you at all, but there are just some things more important than me. Okay? Sometimes I have to die so someone else can live. Or at least I have to make sacrifices so others can thrive. That's just, that's hard life, that's hard truth of life number three. By the way, if you want all five, life is hard. Your life's not about you. It's about God's plans for you. Uh, you're not that important. You're not in control and you're going to die. <laughs> five hard truths that will set you free. That's another talk. Another talk. All right. Now, um, you, see, you see what's been going on. We've been redefining marriage, haven't we? So what are we left with? Well, as of about 15 years ago, anyway, we're left with basically a marriage is about two adults being happy for as long as they like. And if they want to have a kid or two, fine. If not, that's fine, too. But it's about two adults being happy on their own terms for as long as they want. And if they don't want to stay, they can split. That's what's left. That's a redefinition of marriage at multiple levels, right? Now, then, of course, the gay community steps up. They say, really? It's just about two adults being happy? And kid having kids isn't really, like, central? 
well, why can't we get married? And we in the heterosexual community have been misbehaving and redefining marriage for over 50 years, don't have a lot to say. Now, we should have a lot to say, but you see, the point is when you start misbehaving yourself, you get lost yourself. And that's why so many people just say, well, what's the big deal? Well, if you, if you really have that thinking, that's where you end up. What's the big deal? Okay, so the redefinition of marriage that we just had recently from the Supreme Court is only the third or fourth major redefinition of marriage that's really come down the pike. And so I think we all have to accept the fact that we are living in a culture now that is completely poisonous and stands four square against every pillar of marriage that God ever set up. It has no resemblance to biblical marriage whatsoever. Okay, so then where do we go? As a church, back to the plan. God has a plan. All the more for us to have more discussions like we're having today. But we start to articulate. We start to have some historical sense of how we got off the rails. And how the wheels came off and we're riding on the rims. And how all this happened. And begin to then say, how can we find our way back? And to begin to have the courage to teach it, even if you've struggled to live it perfectly. To say, I've struggled, I've made mistakes, but I know God has a plan. And at the end of the day, let's get back to that plan and let God work miracles. <clears throat> because you see, one of the saddest things that I think came out of this, or didn't come out of the synod, was, an, was a vigorous discussion of grace. God's capacity to take two and make them one. God can do that. If we will cooperate and get on board and say, you know, God has a plan and He doesn't give us a plan so that we can get lost and confused and He gave us a plan so we could find our way. He wouldn't give us something that was impossible. It's challenging. All of you who are married know it's challenging for two to become one. Hard. But with grace, all things are possible. And God has a plan. So, I need to start to wrap up, but let me, again, try to bring it back to where we need to be in a room like this today. We know what the culture has systematically done to marriage, so we've got to get clear. Understand what God teaches and start handing that on. That's step one. But step two is to begin to open ourselves to the miracle of they of two becoming one. They are no longer two. They are one. Now, I was not born yesterday. I know that marriages are hard and difficult. Here's That's hard truth of life number one, though. Life is hard. It isn't just that marriage is hard. Life is hard. Priesthood is hard. Religious life is hard. Being single is hard. Life is hard. So let's all accept that this is not easy stuff. This is hard stuff. But that's why we have grace. And that's why we have sacraments. That's why we have the Word of God. And that's why we need prayer. Because this is not easy. I'm not here just playing the fiddle while, oh, where's it so wonderful, isn't it? And you're like, you don't understand. Yeah, I'll see my marriage. See, people get cynical. But you know, isn't it interesting? I think the part of the problem we become cynical about almost everything in our culture except marriage. And what do I mean by that? Well, people still have very high expectations of what a marriage should be. Oh, we'll be love, we'll be wine and roses, and we'll be in love, and Thursday we'll be in love, and it'll be great. And... and here's the problem. Many people want marriage to be ideal, and if there's any ordeal, they want to look for a new deal. <laughs> When you have unrealistic expectations and they're not met, you're very quickly resentful. There's an old saying in 12-step programs, premeditate, or expectations are premeditated resentments. My marriage is going to be like this, and if it's only like this, angry, crestfallen, resentful, bitter. <laughs> See? Marriage is not ideal. Marriage is life. Marriage can be beautiful, and it has great beauty. And yet marriage can also have great difficulties. I've got news for you. Your marriage is not perfect because you're in it. <laughs> now I'll add, 
The church is not perfect because I'm in it. And the church is especially not perfect because I'm a pastor in it. Okay. Start there before you start saying, oh, if only my spouse, listen. The most control you have in your marriage is over yourself. Work your own stuff first, right? And point at your spouse and say, you see, my marriage is a mess because of him or her. Look at those three fingers pointing back at you. See him? <laughs> Father, Son, and Holy Ghost saying, how about you? <laughs> so, we've got to sort of overcome this sort of idealistic notion that marriage can be just wonderful. I'm not telling you that marriage is wonderful. Marriage is hard. Life is hard. Priesthood is hard. Marriage is also beautiful and great and wonderful. It can have, so is priesthood. But there's a lot of sacrifice and a lot of hardship that comes with marriage. We've got to just be honest about that. Now, therefore, first of all, your marriage isn't perfect because you're in it. You're a sinner. And guess what? You married a sinner. And you both got issues. <laughs> so, there's going to be difficulties. Now, what then to do? And again, some difficulties you just you try to overcome. Others you learn to live with. There's just some things your spouse is never going to change on, all right? But what do you love about him or her? Sometimes life is taking the good with the bad and the bad with the good. Not just waiting for the perfect. Because there is no perfect. So we start with working, first of all, keeping that ideal, that, that God, I mean, the, the plan, if you will, of God in mind, be, being aware that we, there is really in this life no ideal marriage. We're not perfected yet but keep moving toward that. Now, here comes another notion, then, to say about marriage. There are wonderful blessings that you get in a marriage. In intimacy, you have great memories together, and, uh, children, there's blessings of home, and, you know, all, all the, you can count all kinds of blessings, but there are other blessings that come in strange packages, but they're still blessings. Now, what do I mean? Some of God's best blessings come in a very strange package called the cross. Now, what is the purpose of every sacrament? That sounds like a trick question, Father. To give us grace. What's that? To give us grace. Okay. Now, every sacrament gives a particular grace, but there's one grace that every sacrament has in common. Does anybody know what it is called? What kind of grace? Sanctifying. Sanctifying grace. Good. We've got some scholars here. <laughs> All right, we have gratia gratum faciens and gratia gratis data, all right? So, the grace, sanctifying grace, the gratia gratum faciens. The, the, um, there is this remarkable truth that every sacrament is meant to make us holy. But guess what? You're a hard case. And you need some strong medicine. I'm not talking about myself, of course. You know how God described us to Jeremiah? I'm sending you to these folks, Jeremiah, you're supposed to talk to them, and I want you to know something. These people have foreheads of brass and necks of iron. That's us he's talking about. Oh, not me, Father. Yeah, you. All right. Father, that's, that's kind of strong. I didn't say it. God did. You talk to God about it. He's, he's the one who described us that way. Amen? We need strong medicine. Medicine of the cross. Our biggest enemy is pride. And only through the humility of the cross are we ever going to be saved. Now listen, your spouse brings you wonderful gifts, joyful gifts, mm -hmm. gifts that you just delight in. You know what else? Your spouse also brings you other gifts in strange packages. For example, you will learn powerfully from your spouse about the need to forgive. And to be patient and kind and long-suffering. Your spouse will teach you that in abundance. And you will also have to receive that in abundance from your spouse. But you know what? It's a beautiful gift because if you don't learn to forgive, you're going to go to hell. You say, oh, you're exaggerating, Father. No, actually, I'm not. Jesus says, uh, my, if, 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 if he says, um, uh, any of you who, for, uh, who does not forgive your brother from his heart, neither will your Father in heaven forgive you your sins. Whoa. So if we don't learn to forgive, we're going to go to hell. Now, your spouse will give you lots of opportunities to learn how to forgive. And be patient and merciful. Again, mercy. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Well, uh, but uh, uh, the book of James reverses it. Merciless is the judgment on the one who has shown no mercy. So in a way, even the difficult things in a marriage are gifts in strange packages. 
Part of the way that you're sanctified is by working through those difficulties, learning to forgive, learning to be merciful and kind and patient and long-suffering. And did you hear the word suffering and long-suffering? There is suffering. Now, I'm a priest and I suffer. People of God make me suffer. I make them suffer. <laughs> it's not terrible, but it's there. But there's a place for suffering. We have to learn these things because this is what it takes to sanctify us. So you see what I'm trying to show you is that we've got to begin to get our head on straight and get it out of the clouds about marriage and bring it in for a landing and realize that romantic love and marriage have their place, but at the end of the day, sometimes this thing has to come in for a landing. And you've got to take it through the long, steady years. And Couples who have been successful all kind of tell me the same thing. They basically say, Father, we just learned to take the bad with the good and the good with the bad. and We fell in and out of love about four or five times in these 60 years. <laughs> really? Yeah. There were times when I couldn't stand her. <laughs> there were times I couldn't stand him either, Father. <laughs> but we're glad we stuck it out. I've grown accustomed to her face. <laughs> the, then the song comes to mind from Camilla. How to handle a woman. Mark thee well, said the wise old man. The way to handle a woman is to love her, simply love her, love her, love her. Right? See? Learn, just learn to love each other, you see. By the way, women, I'm going to give you a little clue about men. Women prize love the highest in a marriage. You know what a man prizes the highest? Respect. Respect. Respect is very important to men. In our culture, is very disrespectful to men. The men are stupid commercials. Men are presented in our culture as buffoons, as sexually depraved, as all they care about is football and beer and sex. <laughs> now, there's actually a fourth thing we care about. <laughs> Respect. Now, I, mean, I don't mean to say that your husband doesn't need you to love him. I'm just going to say that we are looking more, our first desire is for a little bit of respect. That a woman knows that we've, worked hard and we're trying our best and you know there's, there's something important to men. I, I'm not here to give marriage counseling per se but just to kind of say that these are the kinds of journeys that we have to make. A man needs to learn how to express his love and be a better listener and take care of his wife and let her know that she's loved and a woman for her part often needs to learn that one of the things her man needs from her is respect, you know, appreciation, respect and yes love, love. Okay. I need to maybe wrap things up by maybe telling a story, but I want to again remind you of where we've been. We're talking about how the sanctifying grace of every sacrament, the sanctifying grace of marriage is that through all these years there are many blessings that come, and throughout the years a couples begin to, begin to experience a greater intimacy and a, and a deepness, but it's not all lovely pleasant stuff, it's sometimes a hard painful stuff, and it isn't just the marriage itself, but Sometimes the kids create tensions and they have to work together to solve them and they work together and they have a common love, their children, and uh, this helps them to grow and cement their union and their bond. And Little by little, that oneness that God announced at the beginning, they are no longer two, but one, begins to grow. And I've seen this happen with older couples. I don't say every older couple. This isn't simple chronology. But if a couple's been faithful and tried to work through their differences and they've been prayerful and receiving communion and getting to confession, this does happen in many, many lives. Now, I want to just finish by telling you a story of my own parents. And I hope they forgive me for talking, talking about them, but they've both gone home to the Lord now and Mom died 10 years ago, and Dad about 8 years ago, and, um, you know, they had a hard marriage. I'm just going to say it plain. They had a very difficult marriage, especially early on. They're, they were both heavy drinkers, you know. I don't know if you remember. They were married in 1959, and, you know, we like to look back with fondness to the 50s and early 60s before the Revolution, but, you know, there was some bad stuff going down. There was a lot of drinking going on in those years, you know, cocktail parties and knocking back some pretty serious heavy drinks pretty common and mom and dad were both heavy drinkers and they got them they were they were feisty when they drank and they fought a lot and uh, so my sister Mary Ann came along their first year of their marriage and um, there was something deeply wrong with Mary Ann and my sister was mentally ill and they saw that right from the beginning and uh, I came along about a year after that and my other brother came along about a year and a half later and 
So here they are in the early 60s with uh, three kids, and they're kind of drinking a lot, and there's a lot of anger and frustration and concern about Mary Ann, and my dad's trying to get his career off, and he's also now going back into the military, and suddenly he's told he has to go to Vietnam. And uh, my father came back from Vietnam. He went in 68 to Vietnam and came back uh, after fighting a year over there. And uh, he was a changed man. He was a heavy drinker before he left, and he was angry before he left, but he was a lot angrier and a lot heavier in his drinking when he came back. It was a rough time for our family, and my father really struggled to adjust and get back into family life. And um, I don't know that my father ever fully recovered from that war. And, um, but my father went through a long period. Um, he, was a, he was in the JAG Corps in the, in the Navy, and he, he became a lawyer and had some big heavy cases. No, it was a mess. And, the tension in the marriage, my poor sister Mary Ann was hospitalized. She spent her life in 17 different mental hospitals and five or eight different group homes. And poor Mary Ann finally died by suicide. Uh, she died in a fire that she set at, at age 30 in 1991. And um, very, very tragic. And my parents fought for her. They, they tried to get her medical care and they were resisted. And just all kinds of tensions around that. And both of them were drinking. and. Uh, my father was struggling greatly, and um, he had a very, very rough patch there in the middle where he was drinking quite heavily. And my father wasn't a true alcoholic. He was able to kind of pull himself together and stop drinking if he needed to. And um, through all this, he also fell away from the church. And my mother just started praying uh, to get him back to church. And uh, my father was straying from the marriage and other things as well. And mom just kept praying her beads. And she got a little tipsy at night, too. Poor mom, she was into her cups in the evening, got a little rosy cheeked and a little bit, you know. But she loved the Lord, and she, she prayed her rosary. She tried to get to, to Mass, not just regular Sunday Mass, but daily Mass when she could. She was a school teacher. She's a Catholic school teacher, a wonderful teacher. But her struggle in the evening was she kind of got a little tanked up, and her alcoholism would get a lot worse, and eventually she would die from it. But here they were in their middle 40s, and... Um, or early 40s, I guess, for my mom. My dad was in his late 40s because he was eight years older. And they were really considering divorce at that time. And suddenly, though, my mom got pregnant with my baby brother, John. Dad accused her of getting pregnant to save the marriage. <laughs> that takes two, I'm sorry. You know. But um, anyway, uh, so they, they decided to patch it up, thanks be to God. And they, they would thank God for that, too. Sadly, as I say, my... Just before my sister died, though, my, my father came back to the church. It was, it was a miracle. I had been praying for years, and in 1989, he came back to the church. And um, my father did something. He always did it in a big way. He didn't just come back to Sunday Mass. He came back to daily Mass, and he started praying the Rosary every day and the Divine Mercy Chaplet every day and the Station of the Cross every day. You know, he was very intense. I said, Dad, that's a lot of praying. He says, Son, trust me i got a lot of sins to make up for. I said, well, that doesn't work that way, Daddy. He says, trust me, son. <laughs> and so my mother was trying to rejoice, but sadly her drinking got a lot worse. And the great tragedy was that in 1991, my sister died in the fire. And um, so my mother's drinking got worse, and she descended into the real depths of her alcoholism. It got very, very bad. But here's the beautiful part of that story. My father really stepped up to the plate. He said, you know, she never walked out on me. She never gave up on me, and I'm not giving up on her. He would always try to get her to sober up. He said, Nancy, let's go on a cruise. You know, he'd take her on a drive. He'd do whatever he could to get her away from the alcohol. We never knew where she hid half the stuff, you know. And, but, you know, he worked. He prayed. He was always at her side, trying to get her to come to daily mass. And uh, she, she was always very devout, but when she was drinking, she was just incapacitated. And, but he was always by her side, and he never gave up. And he always told us, you know, I'm, I'm never giving up on your mother because she never gave up on me. She, sa she saved me by bringing me back to God, and I'm not giving up on her. And so, sadly, in the uh, year 2005, in the February, it was a very cold night, and Mom slipped out the back door. Dad would lock up the car when she was in her cups. And um, she slipped out the back door probably to buy booze and... Just for a moment, Dad had gone upstairs to make a sandwich. He said, Ch Charlie, he said, I just took my eye off her for a minute. And he just saw the door sitting, and he ran outside calling for her. And he says, I knew she was gone. I knew she's never coming back. And I said, How come, you know, and he just, I just knew. I just knew. And uh, she didn't come back. She never came back. And um, 
Um, she walked out that door and she did get a parent to the liquor store and she downed a fifth of vodka and um, um, passed out. And it was a very cold night and the snowstorm set in. We couldn't find her body for three days um, because the snow had to melt. We finally found her body by the side of the road. And um, she had died of hypothermia, common with alcoholics. And poor mom lost her battle. She tried every day. She fought to stay sober and dad tried to help her get sober. But she had her falls and sadly she fell. But my mother never stopped loving the Lord. It was just that she couldn't beat that one. She just couldn't beat it. But dad was always by her side. Now that's a very tough, tough marriage that I'm describing to you. Here's the final chapter. Here's a man who wanted to divorce his wife when he was in his mid-40s. And after mom died, he said, he sold the house. He said, I can't bear to live here without Nancy. My Nancy isn't here. She was the, she was the home. Heck with the building. And he said, how can I go on living when half of me is gone? And within two years, he died of a broken heart, literally and figuratively. His head congested heart failure. and He got a lot worse after mom died. and He just sank. And he tried his best to carry on. But how can I go on living when half of me is gone? They are no longer two. They are one. They are one. And my father and mother, through a tortuous journey, found that oneness so that one could not bear to live without the other. And within two years, he was dead. I saw him on his final journey. And one of the things he looked forward to was finding his Nancy. And he did. I don't doubt that both my parents probably need purgatory. <laughs> I pray for them every day. <laughs> but I know they both died loving God. And uh, my mother struggled. Imagine my sister dying in fire, my mother dying in ice. Fire and ice. But the miracle of their marriage, they are no longer two, but one. And they got there to a very tortuous route called the cross. They were tough birds. My mom, you think I'm tough and artery? They were tougher. I got it from them. And the Lord had to do a lot of work in their life. But he did it. And the reality that two had become one was fully realized by them. But the last ten years of their life, you couldn't get Charles and Nancy pulled apart. They were always together. See? So, I offer that story to you say that God still works miracles. And not just in the life of my mother and father, but every time a valid marriage takes place, God says they are no longer two, they are one. And that's the miracle. It's just for you and me to start to see the effects of that miracle as the years tick by. And couples start to look like each other, and they start to say very little at the restaurant when they're... Well, it's been a long talk, I'm sorry. But uh, bless you. And I know you might want to say a few things, Jack, and then if there's a few sure. questions. And, oh, but I, I know that it's been, uh, it's been a bit of a long talk for you. So bless you for your patience. You. Marriage is a miracle for all the reasons stated. Amen. He says, therefore I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, unless the marriage is unlawful or, you know, except for unchastity, there's different ways of translating it, that they commit adultery. So what's the exception? What's that all about? Well, <clears throat> there's a, uh, the, the, the general Catholic approach to this word. The Greek word there is uh, porneia, huh? Porneia. That was where we get the word pornography, okay? Porneia is illicit sexual union. Now, it's not adultery. There's a, there's a word for adultery, mochia, huh? 
And it, uh, it has a, uh, in fact, Jesus uses it right there in the very same sentence. So if he had meant uh, that if, if one of the two parties commits adultery, then you're, it's okay to get divorced, then he would have said that. But he didn't. He said pornea, pornea. So what is pornea? Normally, in New Testament Greek, pornea is best translated, you know, premarital sex, or the biblical word is usually fornication. Hmm? So por fornication, pornea, is usually translated uh, as, as uh, fornication. However, pornea can have a broader meaning because it basically means illicit sexual union. So there's other forms of illicit sexual union than premarital sex. So there's incest. Hmm? There's, um, you know, um, homosexual acts and so on, right? So these things uh, would also be understood and included under what we would call pornea, namely illicit sexual acts. So contextually and historically, most Catholic exegetes would agree in the following, that as the gospel left the Jewish world and went into the Greek and Roman world, the Greek-speaking, the Greco, the, you know, the, the Hellenistic and the, and the Roman world, they encountered a world that was sexually depraved, they encountered a world that was con sexually confused, and which did not always have proper understandings of what we call incest. So they would allow all kinds of unions that no Jew would ever recognize as a marriage, where brothers and sisters would sometimes marry, where um, Strangely, even fathers, sons would marry their own mothers, and very strange things that were going on. Now, I'm not saying they were radically common, but uh, they were common enough that there is this little clause that as the gospel leaves the Jewish world, which has very clear instructions and teachings on human sexuality to include incest and forbids the marrying too close in the family bond, namely up to second cousins, as it left that world, it, it was important for the words of Jesus to include this idea that, in effect, let me try to colloquially translate it. Therefore I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, now I'm not talking about those marriages that we don't even consider marriages, like incestuous relationships. I don't, I don't, I'm not talking about those. But if you're in a valid marriage, you, you, and you divorce, and you, and you marry somebody else, you're committing adultery. But I'm not talking about those illicit unions that you shouldn't be in in the first place. That's really the proper understanding. Sadly, the Protestant world largely just translates that word, I think, very strangely, as or interprets that phrase as meaning if, if one of the two parties commits adultery, then it's okay to divorce. That it just doesn't respect the context of the passage or the use of the word. If Jesus had meant adultery, he could have easily used the word mochea. But he didn't. He used the word pornea. Now, did he speak in Greek? Probably not. He probably spoke in Aramaic. But anyway, the, tr the, the inspired text that we have from the Holy Spirit says pornea, not mochia. So I think the Protestants are just dead wrong on that. Um, but uh, that's, uh, so there is a, sadly some disagreement among Protestant and Catholic, but the fundamental Catholic understanding of your, sorry for the long answer, but that what's meant there is in largely incestuous relationships or um, even as depraved as the Greek world was, they never considered homosexual relationships marriages, okay? We become even more depraved, okay? But they, uh, so it's unlikely that Jesus meant homosexual unions, but it would mean that now, certainly, in other words, you see, okay? Yes? Father uh, John, can you refresh my memory about the relationship with your spouse once, once you both die? And well, it, it's, it's, it, yeah, it's an interesting thing. Um, it, is, it is said that, in effect, that um, you know, marriage ends with the death of one of the two spouses, uh, and that they are no longer technically married. So this, of course, leads to sort of heart-wrenching sentimental concerns that sometimes we, we, we raise. But um, I think that uh, what the Lord says is that in, in heaven, uh, people neither marry nor are given in marriage, but live like the angels. So he's first of all saying that there's no sexual intimacy in heaven. But I don't think the Lord means to say by that that we will our spouse will just uh, our spouse that we had here on earth will just be another face in the crowd. Um, but rather that those those beautiful intimate relationships will be even more perfected in heaven. But that um, it isn't. Um, but technically, though, if one spouse dies, they are free to marry. Now, when you think about it. You can sort of see how, <clears throat> in the ancient world, when death was often uh, earlier and more common, 
uh, that uh, you know the idea of permitting people to remarry after the death of a spouse might have been even economically and, and sociologically necessary. So I think that uh, I'm not trying to just simply explain this uh, teaching sociologically, but uh, that uh, uh, technically, yes, at the end, at the death of a spouse, um, there is this, uh, 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 technically the marriage is, is done in terms of a sacrament. Hmm? Um, but on the other hand, think of it this way. The sacrament of the Eucharist will cease when we get to heaven. There's no Holy Communion in heaven, right? Something better takes its place. In other words, we have an even deeper intimacy with the Lord. So, but everything that we celebrated here is still there, but is intensified. And so I would argue that um, although a, a spouse who loses a spouse is free to marry again, these relationships uh, will be perfected in heaven very beautifully. So the Lord doesn't mean to simply set it aside as there'll just be another face in the crowd, if that, if that helps. Mm-hmm. I don't, uh, I don't foresee a widespread abandonment of the tribunal process, although the Pope permits it. Um, I still think that most larger countries that have pretty settled churches and you know are not uh, you know have reasonable means will still continue to have tribunals. Bishops do not want to spend their time reading cases, and they're not going to do it. All right, I guarantee you, they're not going to do it. But uh, beyond that. Um, what the Pope really did is not anything new in for Bishop to say, give me that case, I'm going to handle it. Okay, uh, so I think what the Pope simply did was to, to suggest that in some countries where there is no tribunal process, that he would encourage bishops to take up and be more serious, and that's really another way of saying get a tribunal together. So I think that's the way to understand it. However, that doesn't mean that there won't be individual bishops who will abuse the uh, the process, and I mean, we can't guarantee that there aren't going to be some renegade bishops uh, who will um, sadly waylay a lot of the more thought thoughtful and thorough processes we've tried to have in place. Um, and uh, so, it's, it's, it's a slight more wiggle room, only because the Pope says, remember this is an option and I'd like to remind you, but I think it's really his way of trying to get all bishops to have a a reasonable tribunal process in place uh, so that annulments, when they are requested, can be adjudicated quickly rather than take years sometimes that they do in some places. You know. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Father, I was wondering if you could tell me, I understand that the divorce rate is like in 70 some percent of um, parents who lose a child. Who lose a child? Yes. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know if that's the statistic. I mean, I just trust your word in that. But I think that certainly there, there's going to be a, a, an obvious effect uh, if there isn't help available uh, to couples who suffer tragic losses, mm -hmm. that they do tend to. Sometimes they pull better together, and sometimes they mm -hmm. they, they fall apart. Tension. You know, life has its tensions, and tensions have a way of uh, sometimes uh, causing you know further problems. So I, I I wouldn't dispute the number, but I I wonder if it's quite that high. But it would it's probably high. yeah. I would like to say a word about annulments, because it did come up in the last session that I was in the group before this. And where does annulment come from, and are, is the church just skirting the edges? Well, I want to remind you, the Lord says, therefore, what God has joined together, let no one divide, right? What God has joined together. And that's, the, that's where we get the question of, or the possibility of an, annul, an annulment. Because just because two people get drunk in Las Vegas and go square out vows doesn't mean that that's the work of God, right? I mean, we would have a certain expectation that if something is a work of God, that it would have certain things in place, like two mature adults who are thoughtful and prepared prayerfully for their reception of the sacrament and, and so on, right? So, in other words, well, what the church permits is for people to present evidence that what was a civil marriage was not really a marriage in the full Christian sense. It is not what God has joined together. There ain't no God in it, to put, the, to put it in the colloquial and, of course, they have to present evidence, and that's what we mean by the tribunal process. So they have to, you know, show some evidence that something was lacking, something serious enough, such that what appeared to be a valid sacramental marriage was not in fact so, all right? And um, that's what we mean by um, annulment. Now, does, uh, are some of the ways that we grant annulments, do we give too many? Do we... Um, 
sometimes grant them on grounds that are too shaky? I think so. Um, I'd be in the school of thought that we should tighten that up a little bit and be clearer. Uh, but the synod went in the opposite direction, so yeah, I'm not the synod and so on, I guess, but you know, if I were the synod. <laughs> but, but anyway, I, I have to say that um, um, there are prudential judgments here, and uh, we don't want to be um, uh, so critical that we forget that these are ultimately involve some, some degree of prudential judgment. It's not simple dogma or doctrinal <clears throat> decisions that are being made. There is, if you take the words of Jesus seriously, there are times where there is something that appears to be a marriage, but is lacking. It is not what God has joined together. Okay, And that's what we try to do with the annulment process, to see, based on evidence, if that is in fact the case, that there never really was a marriage in the first place. Let's take two more questions. Okay, I have a question. Okay. Uh, <laughs> there was a, uh, I heard this on the news today, there was a Mormon judge in Utah who had a case where a lesbian couple, so-called you know, gay marriage, whatever you want to call it, lesbian marriage, had a uh, uh, foster, foster child, foster child yeah. which they had, uh, for the last three months, the baby is now nine months old. Mm -hmm. Anyway, he took the foster uh, child away from them. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the role of, obviously there's no marriage, and we, we know lesbian children <coughs> should be raising <coughs> children. Did he, did he do the right thing? Of course, he's being bashed by the media. Yeah. And would a Catholic judge do, be doing the right thing if he did the same thing? Well, let's, let's start with some basic principles. Um, let's take a child who needs to be adopted um, or cared for in a foster care system. Obviously, the best solution for that child is to find a heterosexual married couple. That's our, that's our starting point, right? So that if, if one is identified, then it is best for the child to go there. Now, there could be a few things where the church probably would not object too strenuously if there was really no one who was able to step forward and care for a child. It would probably be better for that child to be in some sort of a home um, than, than in an institution. Now, I'm not sure I personally agree with that, right? Um, but um, so sometimes, um, the best thing that we can find for a child is a single mother or a single father. Um, I think when we get into the question of a so-called gay couple, um, we might be, though, in a situation where... I can only tell my personal thought on it. We're involved there in something that is disordered and irregular from the get-go, and I think, therefore, unhealthy. So it isn't just that, well, we can't find another place. I'm not entirely sure that living in a kind of what we used to call an orphanage wouldn't be a healthier setting than, than to be in a, in a setting that irregular. That doesn't mean to say that's church policy. but Because today, really, orphanages almost don't exist anymore. There's these foster care systems. So what's then, if, if that's the case, then what's better for the child? They'd be kicked around, foster parents, six months here, and they get moved to another foster setting? Because fo the foster care system usually is just temporary lodgings for these kids. So if a semi-permanent thing could be found and they happen to be a lesbian couple, I don't know, maybe it's a prudential judgment there. Would that be better if no heterosexual couple could be identified? I don't know. Um, so my idea of maybe it almost be being better if they were in some kind of a orphanage-like setting, but I don't think those even exist much anymore, oh, not that I'm aware of. So, see, there's a lot of ifs. So I don't, I don't know. I, I'd have to um, know a little bit more about the particulars. But I, yeah. I think ideally, if he took the child away from them, uh, that he would find a, you know, a heterosexual couple or someone to uh, to take care of that child. Thank you, Monsignor. Would you lead us in a closing prayer? Sure. Okay. <clears throat> St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God bring you in, we humbly pray. And do thou, Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. Most sacred heart of Jesus, most sacred heart of Jesus, most sacred heart of Jesus, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, pray for us. Amen. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you so much, Monsignor. Thank you.